Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. It's just five o'clock and I want to waste no time today. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the third and final event in our Daniel Thurs Social Justice Election Tuesday series, co-sponsored by the Social Work Community Outreach Service, SWACOS, and our Office of Continuing Professional Education. Welcome to our alumni, students, staff, Dean Postmas, faculty, community members, and Barbara and David Thurs. Thank you for joining us for this event and to those of you who have joined us for other events in the series. As I have done in the prior events, I wanna thank the members of our team that brought you the Election Tuesday series. Although some of the people are acknowledged in the program and speaking with you today, that would be me, Mary Jaleel and Nina. This series is the product of a collaborative effort that also includes Wendy Shia, Lane Victorson, and Mia Speaks of SWACOS, Adam Schneider of the Macro Curriculum Committee, Isabel Garcia of our Development Office, Shante Hatcher from our Office of Continuing Professional Education, and Matt Kahn from our Communications Office. This team has been working together since April to plan these events and our collective. As I have noted in prior lectures in the series, I'm honored to be able to use the platform of the Daniel Thurs Social Justice Lectures to spotlight pressing social concerns and the efforts to address these. We have in this series focused on the elections and in particular how they're influenced by and influence racial injustice and the fight to have all voices heard and counted in the electoral process. I would also like to underscore that this lecture series was born of a particular vision of social justice that is inclusive, not only in outcome, but in process. In the first two events, we uplifted the work of Baltimore and Maryland-based community organizers and advocates. In this event, we will learn from political scientist and socio-legal scholar, Megan Ming Francis. We believe that this combination of on the ground, first-hand knowledge together with academically informed analysis and historical perspective is very powerful. It can help us know our history, think critically and act strategically to think and rethink what we mean by social justice and how best to work toward it sustainably and with a clear vision. I am personally grateful and honored to introduce our two MSW students who will in turn introduce Professor Fra um, Francis and her talk this evening. So the student leaders um, are who will introduce us and you can read their full bios in the program are Mary Jalil Anir, also known as Mary or MJ. And she's a third year MSW student with a macro clinical concentration. Um, and they also serve as the school's anti-oppression working group and diversity and anti-oppression committee co-chair. Nina Dujikin is a service coordinator at the Choice Program and a UMB MSW student in her advanced year, working towards her macro concentration with a specialization in community action and social policy. Mary Jalila Nina, please, uh, I see the floor to you. Thanks so much um, and welcome everyone. Good evening. Thanks for coming and joining us today. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. May Megan Meng Francis. Um, Dr. Francis specializes in the study of American politics, race, and the development of constitutional law. Dr. Francis received her MA and PhD in politics from Princeton University. She is particularly interested in the construction of rights and citizenship, Black political activism, and the post-Civil War South. She is currently working uh, on a second book project that examines the role of the criminal justice system in the rebuilding of Southern political and economic power after the Civil War. Thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah. Okay. All right, everyone. Um, so I was going to say good afternoon, but I am uh, calling in on the Zoom from Seattle, Washington. I understand that it is likely the evening for many of you. So give me just a moment while I share my screen and get some slides up here. All righty. And 
All right, so good afternoon, good evening. Um, I really want to acknowledge the work of so many um, that actually has made this Election Tuesday series possible as well as the talk today. Um, I have met with a number, a number of members of the committee over the past two months, um, and it has been a joy for me to actually meet some of your classmates as well as to learn from so many of your professors as well. And I am just super excited to be here gathered online with all of you this evening. Um, but I really want to extend my greatest um, or my deepest thanks to all of you. It has been, I know, a very busy season, an incredible, crazy year. Um, and I know many people, many of us are tired of Zoom land. So I am just grateful for those who are taking time out of their day to spend uh, with me online. All right. So first, I would just kind of want to acknowledge um, the anxiety of the moment. So much has happened. And I titled my talk when I was thinking about what to actually, in terms of what to talk about, a year of reckoning COVID-19 BLM protest and election 2020. So it strikes me that the thing that many people have been running from the most is violence, more precisely the structuring role of violence in American society. The violence that led to the establishment of this country, the violence of genocide of indigenous nations, the violence um, that led to the end of slavery, and of course, the persisting violence of racism. And instead of honestly reckoning with the past, we have sanitized it through a curious mythology that obscures rather than illuminates the reasons behind deep, um, the reasons behind deep power differentials and disparities in our society. Today, we have the audacity to get surprised that a country founded on the plunder of indigenous nations and built by the labor of enslaved black people is still violent and racist. We can and should understand how this foundational moment has structured everything else. And then we should do something, take action to help right this wrong. So I tell my students all the time that how you see the world shapes what you believe needs to be done to fix it. The problem as I see it today is that there is a lot of outrage, but little understanding of how we actually got here. And I think that confusion stems from the inability to reckon with the different manifestations of violence in our society, much of which perhaps might be considered everyday or polite violence, much of which people have tolerated for a very long time. So I'm gonna begin my talk today um, in, in terms of talking about three different areas, I think of confusion um, that 2020 has brought us, all of which I believe have much deeper historical roots. And I'm gonna make sense of this crazy picture that you guys, that's on the screen right now. So um, I think it's important to know that I'm a proud product of Seattle Public Schools. As a child, I developed a love for Where's Waldo books. That's why this picture for some of you might be familiar. For those who don't know, these books are filled with hundreds of illustrations of people engaged in various activities. The goal as a reader is to find Waldo, a guy in a red hat and a white shirt. And he is in all of these pictures somewhere in the mix. Sometimes it took me five minutes and sometimes much longer, but, all, but Waldo was always there, hanging out, chilling, mostly having a good time, hiding in plain sight. All I had to do was look for him. Many of the conversations that I've had with well-meaning people about racist violence has sometimes felt like I am living in the most difficult Where's Waldo book in which everyone else ignores the presence of Waldo and focuses on everything else in the environment. For example, a conversation that I've had countless times over the past eight years after every highly publicized police shooting of an unarmed black person goes something like this. A friend calls me or perhaps we're at dinner and says, hey, Megan, I'm just so stressed out about, enter the name of somebody who has been killed by the police. Can you believe it? I can hear the urgent, genuine confusion in their voice. I often mutter a few things like, yeah, girl, it's crazy out there. But what I'm always thinking is, of course I can believe it. For me not to believe it would mean that there has been, that there would have been a long period of American history 
in which black people were not being killed by law enforcement officers. It would mean that I would believe that the violent killing of black people that has invaded my TV and my social media is something out of the norm, that it's aberrational, that it's not a defining feature of American politics. But there has never been, never been a long period in American history in which black bodies have been safe. So why are we surprised now? The violence enacted upon black bodies by the state is not a new phenomenon. It is grounded in a documented history of state violence against black citizens from slavery to reconstruction, to lynching, to Jim Crow, to post-civil rights, to Hurricane Katrina. Yes, of course, Hurricane Katrina to now. It's always, always been part of the larger mural of American society. I don't remember growing up in Seattle with black people who were raised to feel always safe. Most black people I know have been constantly aware of the fragility of black life, especially in interactions with police. However, most people in American society have chosen not to see what has been hiding in plain sight for a very long time. The murder of George, of George Floyd was not the first time that an innocent black person has been killed by the police. There was Breonna Taylor in March, Stephon Clark, Freddie Gray, Philando Castile pulled over for a traffic stop in 2016, Alton Sterling for selling CDs and DVDs in Louisiana, and of course, Eric Garner in 2014, who died in a chokehold saying, I can't breathe 11 times and so many more. The most recent data collected by the organization Mapping Police Violence reveals that Black people are three times more likely to be killed by police than white people. There is a crisis of enormous proportions in the area of policing and incarceration in the United States. People across this nation have paid more attention to the violence today because social media has amplified the violence and made it more visible and because it has been layered over a global health pandemic. But just because we didn't have smartphones that recorded before does not mean that Black people did not endure unjust violence. There is also, it strikes me, tremendous confusion around COVID, about the racial disparity in those dying from COVID-19. We say, or at least many, perhaps maybe not everyone on this call, but many people say that COVID has affected all of us and significantly changed our way of life. And there was this unique moment in March and April of this year of national anxiety and collective suffering when it seemed that the virus could infect, infect and kill any of us. Tom Hanks got it, remember that, it was supposed to be kind of this moment um, that proved, or proved that COVID-19 does not discriminate. But then April went and we collectively watched something else. COVID-19 ripped through and ravaged Black, Indigenous, and Latinx communities. The loss of life has been staggering. In Minnesota, where George Floyd lived, Black Americans account for 6% of the population, but 14% of COVID-19 cases and 33% of COVID-19 deaths. In New Orleans, Black residents accounted for a, a harrowing 77% of COVID-19 deaths. And this was a statistic that came out in June. The COVID-19 tracking project, I think is a great place for those interested in following the race and ethnicity data around COVID infection and death. Overall, the COVID tracking project details that nationwide black people are dying at 2.3 times the rate of white people. The statistics that so many of us followed revealed an ugly truth. COVID-19, the virus, perhaps does not discriminate, but structural racism has created the conditions through which certain communities will be disproportionately impacted. What I mean by this is that the persisting health disparities impact, of course, access to adequate health care, impact the quality of health care, impact the delivery of services, but also, and perhaps most importantly, impact the underlying environmental conditions that make one more or less susceptible to illness. Black and Latinx people are more likely to live near waste sites and thus be exposed to toxins and pollutants. A disproportionate number of Black, Latinx, and Indigenous communities do not have 
drink, 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 uh, sorry, drinkable water and have higher rates of asthma, diabetes, and cancer. Racism is, as a team of researchers um, has described in I think a really interesting article, and this is a quote from it, racism is a fundamental cause of disease and the strange but familiar root of racial health inequities. COVID-19 didn't just reveal deep health disparities, it stopped people from running from the truth, literally. So kind of COVID-19 has given me a lot more time to think and I have an unproven theory that part of the reason that the Black Lives Matter protest felt different this time is because people couldn't run. In so many ways, I think that white people in this country have always wanted to run from their culpability and complicity in upholding racist structures. That this country is racist is not new. It's not even new con to conservatives. But racism has often seemed so overwhelming that well-intentioned people have acknowledged the presence of racism, but done nothing to fix it because there is no time and there are so many other things to do. But this time, this time in 2020, there was nowhere to go, nowhere to escape because COVID-19 made it so that the normal places of refuge of shelter were closed. There were no recitals, no long champagne brunches. Most office places were shuttered. The performing arts, our ballet, opera, theater shut down. It was you at home with your screens and all of the news and nowhere to go but to face the truth of being a citizen or living in a country that treats black people as if they are only partial citizens. Um, just one second here on my notes, hold on. News. Uh, one second, I'm sorry here, I lost some things. Okay. All right, so in 2020, even through COVID, even through the Black Lives Matter protests, 2020 was not finished. Dismay over the private murder of Breonna Taylor in her home while she was sleeping and the public spectacle murder of George Floyd was then met with more confusion after November 3rd. Many people had been waiting, organizing, planning to oust Trump. His abusive comments about women, his explicitly racist comments about Latinos, Asians, and Black people were met with righteous outrage. He bungled the response to the pandemic, undercut the work of environmental conservationists, and so on and so forth. He was a dangerous, many people argued, a dangerous white supremacist running for re-election in 2020. There was no way he was going to win. People would come out, this was the theory, people would come out and mass and vote for the Biden-Harris ticket. Not because they, they loved Biden or they loved Harris, but because the last four years is not who we are. The guardrails of American democracy would save us. But that's not what happened. November 3rd turned into November 4th and November 5th. The election was too close to call. Historically, elections hold a mirror up to this nation. They are a type of reckoning. It is the time for masses, a lot of Americans to exert their voice in the form of the vote, to say if they support a particular candidate and political agenda or not. What we did know um, after the election was that Trump received more votes than any other Republican presidential nominee in history. We also knew that counties with the highest coronavirus rates, coronavirus rates voted for Trump. Over 70 million people watched the last four years play out and signed up for the circus again. This is who America is. The fact that the Biden-Harris ticket did not did when did end up winning is because people of color in old and new swing states 
organized, registered thousands of new voters and put their bodies on the lines as poll watchers and vote, vote counters and as everyday citizens who went to vote despite a global pandemic. And yet still, after the votes were counted, many in the GOP refused to accept the results, charging election fraud. Many Americans on both sides of the aisle were confused and there were far too many think pieces published for me to even read. But we should not lose sight that a violent attempts to keep people of color from voting have always been a part of American history. This year uh, looked like white militias showing up to polls and caravans of people riding through predominantly black neighborhoods. The fraud as alleged was not actually about ballots. The fact that the fraud allegations were in mainly Black and Latinx counties are actually about the perceived fraud of Black and Latinx citizenship. The problems that we see today, so the problems around racist violence and the confusion around its origins, the confusion and problems that we see that emerged around the COVID-19 health pandemic, as well as the election, as well as this past presidential election, did not, of course, begin this year, didn't begin with COVID, didn't begin with the murder of George Floyd. They didn't even begin with Trump. So let me say this a bit more explicitly. All of the problems that, laid, that were laid bare in 2020 were around before 2020. It's just that many people chose not to see them. We are a nation that has been running from its history and its present. Every time a politician has said something like, this is not who we are, a chorus of people shouted back actually in person or online, this is, this is who we always were. The great African-American sociologist, David B. Du Bois tells us that a system cannot fail those it was never meant to protect, end quote. The system as it currently operates does not provide justice and safety, nor does it treat people equally because it was never meant to. The ugly reality of who we are has been laid bare and who we are is this, a nation with a manifestly unequal healthcare system, a system of policing that treats people of color as violent threats to the social order and a democracy in crisis. The good news is, is that in the battle for the soul of this nation, there is another chapter. People have dreamt, organized, into movements and fought back. For nearly three straight months during the spring and summer of 2020, thousands of protests and rebellions exploded across the country. More than 20 million people of all races from large cities to rural locales have marched and protested in a defiant display of public mourning and rage, demanding accountability for the brazen murder of countless Black people at the hands of law enforcement. Their voices, their bodies, and their imaginations have awakened a sleepy nation to the urgency of addressing deeply entrenched racial injustice. Public opinion data confirmed the shift, noting that in June and July, um, that it shifted dramatically in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. Pulling data now indicates a majority of Americans believe that the police are more likely to use deadly force against Black people and that there is a lot of discrimination against Black people in society. The shift, at least for me, as somebody who teaches American politics and has focused on Black social movements, feels surreal. Let's remember that in 2014, many Americans thought it acceptable to debate the phrase Black Lives Matter. Something that we've heard, of course, a lot was why can't we say all lives matter? It was a question in many of the lectures that I gave um, in the years in, the, in 2014, 15, 16, and 17. Fast forward to the present where members of Congress and police officers take a knee, raise a fist, and proclaim Black Lives Matter and a public performance of solidarity with protesters. Perhaps most importantly, Black protesters' calls to reimagine justice, defund the police, and reinvest in community programs, all of which were once considered radical ideas, 
have suddenly made their way into the mainstream of American public thought and action. I'll never forget, for example, the shock I felt watching the presidential debates when Chris Wallace from Fox News asked the question at the presidential debate, and this is, I'm gonna quote here, what does reimagining policing look, what does reimagining policing mean, end quote. Now, both candidates didn't answer the question well, as my students might say, they didn't have the range, but it marks an important moment that would have been inconceivable even last year. The rhetoric of the Black Lives Matter protesters have made their way into the vocabulary of a Fox News journalist and on a national debate stage. For millions of Americans, the protest has come as a surprise, but they are not. The current transformative moment is built on the legacies and work of previous Black protest movements. We don't get a Black Lives Matter 2020 protest without protest after, Zimmer, after the Zimmerman acquittal for killing Trayvon Martin in 2013, or the Ferguson uprising in 2014, or the Baltimore Black Lives Matter protests in 2015. But it goes back even further than the 21st century establishment of the movement for Black lives. The long Black freedom struggle developed the political language, strategies, and organizing infrastructure that has culminated in the present moment. Examining this longer lineage of Black protest movements is critical, I think, in helping all of us understand how we arrived, where we are going, and the present situation about today. But let me first, I'm going to get both of uh, all these out here. This is going to make sense in a minute. But let me first start off uh, with what I think has sometimes hindered our imagination of rights making in this country. So civil rights history is interesting. It's my jam. My entire career has been spent and focused on the arc of civil rights, of retelling stories that we think we know well, but in different ways. And, our, and in our national reckoning, of civil rights, I find it so unsettling the way that civil rights is imagined, packaged, and sometimes, perhaps oftentimes, sold to the American public. American, for the most part, American democratic exceptionalism cannot make sense of the persisting violence endured by Black citizens throughout the entirety of the nation's existence. Instead, many journalists, scholars, and everyday people have practiced, I think, a form of scholarly or perhaps violence in the form of erasure, whereby the specter of anti-Black violence emerges in the 1950s and the 1960s um, become a vindication that liberalism is still possible and that Black lives can matter inside of American democracy. The civil rights movement, as far as most are concerned, started in 1954, culminates with a large scale protest and then ends in dramatic fashion with the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The story begins with little black kids being, a, being allowed to attend school with little white kids through the Brown v. Board of Education Supreme Court decision. It gained speed with the freedom rides, the lunch counter sit-ins, and the march on Washington. Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, and nonviolent demonstrators are the heroes of the story. And then it reaches its peak with the Civil Rights Act of 1964. There are recognizable names that are a part of this traditional civil rights narrative of which very few are women. Men are at the center. People like Coretta Scott King kept house and powerful figures such as Ella Baker and Diane Nash are relegated to the sidelines. The villains tend to be people like Bull Connor and explicit segregationists, not well-meaning white clergy or perhaps white philanthropists. More on this in a minute. It is, that is kind of the 1954 to 1965 timeline. That is the civil rights story. It is our civil rights story. It tells us, or it says, that confronted with grave injustices, America changes. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice, or so they like to say. This narrative is everywhere. If we look at the Hollywood films that have been funded over the last few years, especially the big blockbuster ones, there is slavery, enslavement, right? And then there is civil rights activism, Selma and even Lee Daniels, the butler. Um, 
All right. However, I want to propose that that is the wrong way, or perhaps that timeline is insufficient. In so many ways, I think it's woefully incomplete. The problem with this triumphant story from 54 to 65 is that it overlooks the decades upon decades of suffering and struggle and the very long and complicated, not short and compact process of change in this country. It tells us that there was only one way that change happened, nonviolent direct action through appealing to the moral conscience of Americans and that change is swift and that America ultimately will align her institutions with her cherished ideals if people would just stand up and make clear the injustice. My worry with this story is that it props up one narrow vision of rights making and binds us to the very long process of change and to a range of different strategies. This traditional, dare I say, romantic narrative of civil rights misunderstands the focus of the movement. Jim Crow wasn't really focused on lunch counters and water fountains. It was a system that focused on black death by the state and by private individuals. And the dominant focus on education, I think in some ways has hidden the violence of racism. In many ways, the sanitized history has been weaponized against people and groups in the present moment who are pushing for more and are utilizing a different set of strategies. This narrative has been deployed in an attempt to help this nation heal, but you can't heal if you don't tell the full truth. In general, I'm gonna to go to this slide first. In general, the American public knows little about the long tradition of Black Lives Matter protests. And it is my belief that the long history of the Black Lives Matter movement can teach us all about the durability of white supremacy, how to hold institutions accountable, and how to fight for justice using the tools that we already have today. Throughout Reconstruction and especially afterwards, African Americans faced a regime of racial terror. Actually, let me go back. Frustrated with the promises of the Reconstruction Amendments, many whites banded together and used lynchings and mobs to enforce a post-emancipation racial order that protected white supremacy. The same period marked the granting of citizenship rights to African Americans is also known as the highest number of lynchings of African Americans in history. The Equal Justice Initiative, which has collected the most comprehensive data, reported the grim finding that between 1877 and 1950, there have been over 4,000 African American lynching victims. The killing of Black people in the absence of consequences for white perpetrators was the most effective way to undermine the promises of emancipation. In 1900, the civil rights icon Ida B. Wells spoke at a gathering in Chicago and delivered a stinging indictment. Our country's national crime is lynching. Wells would know best as she was the first person to investigate lynchings collect data on black death and then highlight the injustice of lynching and the loss of black life through her incredible journalism work on a national scale. Wells revealed that lynching was intricately tied to the protection of white economic power. It was an unofficial tool of the state to push back black economic advancement. The linking of anti-black violence to the system of capitalism is a central relationship that black radical activists would take up and place at the, at the center of their versions and visions of liberation in the 1960s and especially in the 1970s. And we see this also in terms of the relationship between racism and capitalism also being taken up in the movement for black lives. Wells' work highlights the importance of the process of knowledge production, the need for freedom fighters to collect data and write their own stories. When Wells began her activism, the protection of black lives from lynching and mob violence was not considered a civil rights issue, nor was it a mobilizing cause for black people. Her investigations and writings about lynchings dramatically shifted the frame of how to understand the violent spectacle. 
Wells named the unjust violence and called it out for being a tool of white supremacy, thereby providing the political language for black people to articulate the harm they endured and the responsibility of the government to remedy it. Finally, it is Ida B. Wells who effectively situated lynching at the crux of American democracy. In order to protect the voting, education, and workplace rights of Black people, the senseless killings of Black people had to stop. The protection of Black lives was the first civil right, I think, and I say that a lot because I think that is something that many people forget. Influenced by her activism, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, also known as the NAACP, the oldest civil rights organization today, um, was formed in 1909 and led the largest movement in history against lynchings and racist mob violence. This picture I have up of this flag that which has been in circulation over the past few years was a picture outside of the NAACP's offices in New York City when they got word from any of their contacts of, of a lynching or mob violence, they flew this flag to let people know how often lynchings of black people occurred in this country. But before the NAACP focused on their historic segregated ba seg battle against segregated education, they spent two decades, many people don't know this, they spent two decades in the early 20th century exposing the dangerous levels of racial violence endured by black people. Um, and I chronicle like, this tremendous battle um, in a book that I wrote about the NAACP's campaign um, around racial violence. The book is trying to make a claim about how black citizens constructed civil rights in American politics in the darkest of times before the landmark Brown Supreme Court decision at the height of lynchings abandoned by both national parties and decades before the student sit-ins and the heyday of the civil rights movement how did the NAACP, how did Black people organize in a political environment that did not yet treat them as full citizens? The NAACP's campaign against racial violence, I think is particularly important to understand for what it tells us about the process and time horizons of radical social justice movements today. Many of us have been trained to understand the Black Lives Matter movement through the lens of the civil rights movement of the 1950s and the 1960s, that kind of tra traditional romantic narrative I described earlier, but that would be insufficient. The literature on the success of the civil rights movement emphasizes something, of course, called the political opportunity structure, the theory that sympathetic openings in the political environment are necessary for social movement success. Yet there is not a lot of literature that explains why and how Black people organize when there does not appear to be political openings. The NAACP's anti-lynching campaign in the first quarter of the 20th century reveals the creation of opportunity and possibility as a first stage of struggle. Opportunities in a violent white supremacist political regime are not organic they must be created through nimble organizing. The NAACP's anti-lynching organizing displays the importance of building a mass movement of people focused on the protection of black lives to creating new political and legal openings. So in order to fight this racist violence, the NAACP organized mass demonstrations. This picture before you is of a big um, a, a protest in, in 1917. 10,000 African-Americans organized by the NAACP marched down Fifth Ave in New York City to protest violence that occurred in East St. Louis. Um, so they organized mass demonstrations. They also worked and did kind of became uh, lobbyists to pass an anti-lynching bill in Congress. It passed the House of Representatives and then died in committee in the Senate. But there was this massive campaign to see if maybe we could push Congress to do something that it had never done before. And then finally, in their most extraordinary win, this racial violence campaign, they win this big Supreme Court case, Moore v. Dempsey, in 1923. Um, it's a landmark criminal procedure case in which the Supreme Court agrees with the NAACP's lawyers and says that mob-dominated trials violate the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. It was this massive, extraordinary, in-your-face campaign that forced America to confront lynching and mob violence. It asked America how strong was its commitment to protecting Black lives. 
When concern was raised at a meeting that the NAACP's agenda was not broad enough, that it didn't address other areas that I think many of us now associate with civil rights, such as housing, um, segregation, and voting, one of the NAACP's Black leaders explained, and this is a quote, all the, all the Negro wanted was a chance to live without a rope around his neck, end quote. And it was a sobering but necessary reminder that if the protection of Black lives was not secured, everything else would mean very little. What did segregated education mean if Black people were killed? What did desegregated neighborhoods mean if Black people could be killed? What did it mean to secure the right to vote if you couldn't live? As a result of the NAACP's organizing in the first quarter of the 20th century, the rates of lynching and mob violence dramatically decreased. The activism of Ida B. Wells and the NAACP helped to explain the emergence of the protection of Black lives as the pinnacle issue in the early Black freedom struggle. This work also showcases the importance of the strategies of knowledge production and mass protest to the fulfillment of these goals. But if the energy of the Black freedom movement was focused on the protection of Black lives, then why is the heyday of Black activism remembered as centered on voting and education? The shifting away from racial violence to education deserves a little bit of explanation, which I'm happy to go into more detail later on, but I want to say a little bit about that right now. During the late 1920s, the NAACP was approached by the Garland Fund, a radical left-wing foundation. Acknowledging the organizing prowess of the NAACP, the Garland Fund proposed a dramatic new initiative centered on, find, centered on fighting segregation in public schools through the courts. The Garland Fund proposed pre, proposal presented a unique set, set of hurdles to the NAACP as it did not seamlessly map onto the NAACP's anti-lynching agenda. Throughout the process of developing this plan, the NAACP's leadership protested the emphasis away from racial violence to education in numerous ways. However, in a Jim Crow world where white men and women controlled the purse strings, the NAACP understood their place in the racial hierarchy and the importance of compromise, even if it was an unbalanced compromise. If education was the area where funding was available, the NAACP would expand its activism around education. And after all, the NAACP cared deeply about segregated education. It simply was not at the top of the organization's agenda. Focusing on the Garland Fund and the NAACP, I developed in another article this concept that I call movement capture to describe the process whereby private funders use their influence to shape the agenda and strategies of vulnerable civil rights organizations during the early years of movement formation. According to this capture framework, funders are self-interested actors that can't exploit their elevated financial position by linking the provision of funds to the pursuit of new goals or by shifting the salience of existing agenda issues. This moderating role does not come to funders by accident, but rather as a central philanthropic tenant. In the end, the education desegregation campaign proved to be both more and less than the Garland Fund or the NAACP envisioned. Right, so what happens over the course of a few years with the Garland Fund's money is the NAACP then shifts its, its agenda away from kind of a dominant focus on racial violence to then what becomes a dominant focus on education. The increased focus on education had the unintended impact of reducing the NAACP's activism around issues that concerned racial violence um, and the campaign around workers' economic rights. However, the campaign also had the effect of dramatically transforming constitutional law with the landmark Brown decision. The funding of the desegregation campaign represents, I think, a critical juncture in the NAACP and the larger civil rights movement, 
away from a dominant focus on racial violence to education after 1930. This earlier period highlights the centrality of racial violence as an issue, the importance of shifting strategies, and the consequences of white funders in black rights making. So I'm gonna be honest and also say that I read history, part of my, my kind of talking about, as well as my own personal enjoyment about reading history is to make sure that I don't go crazy. For I believe that the past can light a way out of the present darkness. We may not have been here before, but we have been here before. White supremacy cannot be overcome unless you name it, face it, and work to lessen its impact. So where does all this history leave us today? Today, I believe that we are in an inflection moment. History tells us that when things crumble, when they fall, when the house burns down, there is an opportunity in the rebuilding process. Do you ignore the lessons of history and build the same, or do you build a new house? We have spent, it seems to me, so much time trying to hold up what does not work, plugging up holes in a sinking ship, bordering up a leaking roof on the house, the past four years, and especially the last year, have made the effective argument that it's not working. Today, we need to do a better job at reckoning with the past, repairing past harms, and fighting for a new world rooted in the imaginative dreams of freedom fighters past and present. It is never lost on me that the political and legal institutions in this country are structured to overwhelm people, to make people feel powerless, or that the only change that is possible is change on the margins. But as social workers, y'all are uniquely situated. You actually know how to work with people unlike a lot of the people that I work with. You know how to fundraise and move money to those most in need. You are often in the intermediary space between people needing resources and powerful government entities that actually have resources. So you have the tools and one, I might say also, you have the power. But I'm gonna ask a few questions here. So if you have the tools, but what are you rooting in? What is guiding how you choose to show up? Are you operating out of a place of fear or radical possibility? Who has structured or what has structured your lens of possibility? Are you pushing for more or holding the middle? I'm asking these questions because it strikes me that there is so much power that we leave on the table every day, every month, every year, because we do not actually understand our history and are thus operating off of a set of skewed or a biased set of facts and not tapping into our full power. So the Democrat Party, I think, to return back to <laughs> return back to politics, is a useful example. Mainstream Democrat organizing had written off much of the Black South because of low voter registration numbers, preferring to cling to a narrative about Black voter apathy. When the when the one might say prophet Stacey Abrams spoke and said that Georgia could become a swing state, Tom Perez and many of the rest of the Democratic establishment chuckled and did not fund her efforts, looking instead to places in states like Florida. Instead, Abrams and other leaders like Ms. Latasha Brown, who you see here with her hand raised from the Black Voters Matter Fund, reframed the critique of Black voter apathy and turned it into a critique of the Democrat Party's get out the vote efforts, stating, and I'm gonna quote here, we have a system, says Ms. Brown, that cares more about voting than the voters. Abrams and Brown knew their power and their abilities. Black organizers and places like Georgia rooted in the history of Black activism, Black people have always wanted to vote and focused on engaging Black people where they were. And thus moving from, as stated by, by Ms. Brown here, moving from transactional to transformative politics. Don't just show up before every election, every four years show up in the years in between and show people that you actually care. Think about, reframe, reimagine what get out the vote efforts, organizing, mobilization might actually look like. As a, resort, as a result, we know Georgia flipped. 
Fighting looks like collective organizing. Fighting looks like resisting the logic of possibility from those in positions of power. Fighting looks like listening. Fighting looks like the creation of imaginative spaces. Now we're going to go back to my monopoly man here. And it's not just institutions like the Democrat party that need to address history and transform. It's easier for many of us to pile on the Democrats, but it's also benevolent institutions such as the philanthropic sector. Today's funders I think are continuing to act in ways that are undermining radical movements for justice. We are again witnessing a lack of courage from big philanthropy. The protest against systemic racism disrupted the normal functioning of philanthropy, caught off guard by the massive protests calling out systemic racism and racial capitalism. Many philanthropic leaders have shrunk instead of, of risen to meet this historic moment. The social movement for some philanthropists was too black and the agenda was too radical. For these protests, far from these protests feeling like the crescendo of decades of funding social justice organizations, the protests in so many other ways have exposed a gilded philanthropy out of step with the causes it purports to support and lacking in, in imagination about how to seed power and support black led movements. But it doesn't have to be like this. Today, there are tremendous challenges and opportunities for the philanthropic sector in their relationship with racial justice movements. First, philanthropic institutions need to examine the past harmful ways that wealth was created and that funding was conducted and repair. Charting a new path towards justice requires a willingness to address and repair past injustice. The problem I think with many philanthropists is that it doesn't that is that they don't even understand what they have done wrong. So they can't do better in the future. This is a fundamental problem that needs to be addressed through a closer examination of foundation organizational culture and grantee harm assessment. Second, I think there is a real opportunity to move from a traditional strategic model of grant making to a movement centered model. A movement model of grant making believes philanthropy should be in service to movements for social justice. The traditional management consulting return on investment model is holding funders back from funding racial justice movements because movement metrics do not collapse neatly into evaluation impact criteria. Thus, instead of thinking about what is required of the grantee to reach certain benchmarks to receive additional funding, this framework asks funders to think about what is required of them. Practically speaking, it means centering movements and not issues. And it would mean inviting movement leaders into the grant making process as collaborators to share power. A movement centered model acknowledges that foundations and consultants are not the best authorities on how a movement grant should be carried out nor what the metrics of success might look like. And this is because movements are structured differently in terms of how they behave, how accountability operates and the end goals. This is gonna be my last slide. So Maya Angelou says, and this is something that always echoes in the back of my mind, history despite its wrenching pain cannot be unlived, but a face with courage need not be lived again. In so many ways, I think that 2020 is the year of reckoning. Reckoning requires action. It requires us to examine the past but not just in terms of to spend like this time and to learn and do nothing. It requires us to examine the past and to use that knowledge to repair past harm and then to act differently in the present. I will also say that I think that 2020 has also been the year of organizing, of incredible organizing a year in which the power of people has been on display like never before. And it strikes me that in this tremendous display of citizen activism, that protesters have created space for many different professions, including social work, to rethink the relationship to social movements. The protests have made, have made the argument that the current landscape is not working. This disruption I think has created a unique opening to work together 
to listen differently, to trust differently, and to address the question, who do we want to be? What social workers choose to do and what the rest of us choose to do with this rebuilding opportunity and how we answer this question is a story that is still being written. Thank you so much. I'm gonna stop the share here. All right. Okay, I think that's it. All right. I had a technical difficulty over here, but I'm back. Hey guys. <laughs> So awesome, Megan. Thank you so, so, so much. Um, touched on so many amazing things, so many amazing things <laughs> um, that I appreciate you speaking to is the great work of Ida B. Wells. Um, Cause one of the great things that I learned in my great social work education at the School of Social Work here is that Ida B. Wells is one of the founding black people in social work at the same time as Jane Addams, who was somebody that we learn about in depth. Um, Jane Addams and Ida B. Wells were literally working together um, doing things and Ida B. Wells being Jane Addams considered Ida B. Wells a friend and a controversial friend nonetheless, right? Controversial friend, that's what the article says, right? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, just just quickly on that. So um, I actually don't at all. I, whenever I talk about the NAACP wrote a whole book and like, and, and also in, in terms of public talks, I never not talk about Ida B. Wells because in so many histories around organizing, around civil rights, um, she has been totally written out of the story and her work is just so foundational to the way that many of us operate, right? Whether it is in terms of social work, political science, sociology, um, activism, that like her work is incredible. So I just think that it's, it's important to center that and, and speak her name always. I agree 100%. Literally, her work with Jane Adams is why Jane Adams was one of the founding members of the NAACP in Chicago, right? Like that's that's some deep social work history and justice work, right? Um, so now, well, we do have a few questions that are coming through the chat. Um, one that I think speaks to this example of Ida B. Wells um, is how does the education system, how do you, how would you suggest um, the education system begin to teach the version of history um, and the civil rights that you just spoke about? So the next generation has a more realistic view of our nation's history. Yeah, so first, thank you for that question. I think, you know, this, this year has just given me a lot of time to reflect about um, public education and the myths that not just in terms of like my students hold, but like we as a nation hold and how much learning needs to actually happen. Um, I think in terms of, it's actually, I, I, I tend to think that it's not hard. So I, whenever I teach civil rights to my students, I normally have the slide that I have that I had there with the, with the, uh, with the movie posters. And then I have a stop sign that like then flat then like moves across the screen I couldn't just I couldn't figure out how to do that on zoom um, but then I have a stop sign and then I just ask students I'm like listen the way that we should understand the rights the civil rights movement is something um, that like you can think about in terms of a timeline from the end of the period of enslavement onto today that it's an ongoing movement um, and then I focus on different moments in terms of the longer trajectory I do think that the other but I do think that what's central to education describing this longer history is something that I felt like the protest today helped do, which is that there has been a way that that American society and education has been running from racial violence for so long, right? It's like, it's it, as if it just happens in these like small little silos, right? Instead of it being a central, like a struct, like racial violence being a structuring aspect of American democracy of how we are, who we are today. And so we don't talk about that at all. Um, and so I think for me, one of the crucial aspects is some of the work, I think incredible work actually that the Equal Justice Initiative led, led by Brian Stevenson is doing is talking about the history of lynching in this country, talking about mob violence. We tend to think that like, oh, you can't talk to young children about that. You must, you must talk to young children about that, right? Um, and so I think for me, that's super important to talk about, about racial violence and the longer and that longer, tra that longer trajectory. Also to make clear that people understand that like, change, you don't get a, ch you don't get change in a decade. That's part of the problem. People are like in 2015, 2017, 
what was a Black Lives Matter successful movement successful? And I was like, whoa, hey, <laughs> like, like, do we do we expect that like in one year that entrenched white supremacy is all of a sudden going to crumble, right? Like the change processes in this country have always taken a very, very long time. And part of also important also what it means to understand change processes is also to understand counter processes, right? That the way that other people then work against cross purposes to a, a hold structures uh, like of oppression. And so that's also something that I think that I wish that we did a better job at talking about. But yes, to the question about like how to teach education, we gotta, un we gotta undo myths, we gotta extend the timeline, we gotta get more people in there, right? We gotta talk about more, a more dynamic process and we have to center violence. We can't like, there's just no other way. Um, I have a, we have a follow-up question to that or kind of a related question on the same topic. What is the political value of this false or incomplete history that has now become the dominant narrative and then whose interests are served by these narratives and how? Ooh, spicy question. I love it. <laughs> um, so I think that's been a, that has been a, a project and an intention, I think of a, like a very moderate, like in terms of like, like center moderate, moderate group of individuals who have wanted to at least project um, and, and believe, I think, truly do believe, right? That, that, the, that the kind of the, the arc of the universe bends towards justice, that we are in a society that, that at the end of the day, that when grave injustices are made clear and made apparent that society changes. Um, and I think that in terms of that for the most part, like that has been centered. It has also been clear that um, that has been a project for many who have wanted to undercut the work um, and discredit the work of more radical um, activists who wanted something else, right? Who've argued, there's been many different moments throughout American history that have argued for decolonization, right? That have argued for the centering of racial violence that have argued for a greater understanding um, of, of black worker rights, um, different conceptions of labor. And it seems to me, I mean, this is also going to be some of the work that actually is going to intersect a bit with philanthropy. There's this a, a lot of interesting work. Karen Ferguson has a great book on this actually um, about the Ford Foundation and their work in undercutting the black power movement, a belief in terms of working with the Johnson's, uh, uh, President Johnson's Great Society and, and believing that like, yes, so, American society is racist and it's white supremacist and it's white supremacist and we need to change. Um, and we want to, as, as a foundation, uh, basically pilot a number of programs um, and work with the Great Society. And at the same time, right, Black people are in the street. Brown people are in the street, right? We have a black power movement, we have the Chicano movement because after 64 and after 65, black people and brown people are like, this is not, this is not these political and legal reforms. It's, it's, it, it has not yet impacted our lives, right? We are still living in projects. We, are st we still don't have jobs. We want a whole scale transformation of the political system. Right. And so what is at the time happening is that people are in the streets. The Ford Foundation is like, we want change, but like what uh, let's 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 fund Maldef. Let's extra fund, let's extra fund different in terms of legal organizations. Let's focus on a courtroom and a political strategy that like some of these demands, that's going too much. That that's going too far. And so what the Ford Foundation does is then works with um, different organizations to think about, okay, let's get it, let's focus on black arts. Let's focus on a black political elite that can then be the representatives of the people, right? Um, so I think there's a number of, in terms of whose interest has it served, I think it served a lot of people's interest. But to me, in terms of if I had to like think about like a group per se, it, it's people who have been resistant about more radical demands um, from individuals who have been like an activist, like on the sidelines and in, uh, and in the streets. And there's been these moments in the late sixties where it seemed like something else was possible as well as the fifties, as well as the 1920s. This is the last thing I'm gonna say on this. I can say a lot. Um, sometimes the question that I often got for, from the, about the NAACP's campaign around racial violence in the first quarter of the 20th century was, did you really think 
did the NAACP really think that they could have had a whole movement in this country in the 1920s that's centered on racial violence? That is so crazy. But is it? Because it, by 1923, the NAACP had a win in the House of Representatives, had a mass movement of people shifting public opinion, had met with two presidents, the segregationist Woodrow Wilson, Warren G. Harding in the White House, and had secured a landmark criminal procedure decision. Around voting, almost nothing. Around education, almost nothing, right? So even in the 1920s, something perhaps, something different was, was possible. And then that kind of fell, went, fell, fell to the sidelines. But there was different visions all throughout the 20th century um, uh, that, that people had been working and organizing around. Um, and that we get to kind of a movement that emerges out of the, out of the 60s that is really centered on legislation um, and, and, and legal victories, um, I think is, is fascinating and problematic, but I'll end there. Thank you for that in-depth response. <laughs> uh, it's beautiful, it is beautiful. Uh, so another question that we uh, received in the chat was, so President-elect Biden noted in 60 Minutes that he plans to address back violence by bringing together governors and police chiefs, et cetera, to have national dialogue. Um, what are your thoughts on that? It's like a setup question, <laughs> So, you know, um, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to say this right, this recorded conversation here. Um, in terms of, <laughs> and I, here's my thing. I think in this moment in 2020, you listen, you listen to activists and you listen to protesters. That's not, that's not what the movement has said that we need, right? The movement has not said, you know what we need? We need another summit. We need another summit of people in power. <laughs> people like of police chiefs and governors. I, I've been through a lot of different or, organizations, platforms, and also their set of demands. And I have never seen that. Where is that? Like this, I, I don't, it, it is not there, right? And it's clear that there's actually been a critique of those type of proposals, right? That in terms of, um, I think explicit critiques of, especially in the Obama and the Obama administration, there's been these kind of summits of Department of Justice with police chiefs. And what we know, of course, and this has been made so clear, is that that type of kind of conversation is a type of reform conversation, right? Like, what can what can the establishment do to reform its practices? Yet everything that we have heard, that we have heard from a mass millions of people in the spring and summer of this year is not that we want some type of reform. It has been that the rot is at the core of the system, right? And that there needs to be in terms of this system doesn't, does not work anymore and we need something else. And that there have, and there are other perhaps kind of solutions, alternatives that people have already imagined and have already created that focus on accountability, that focus on harm reduction, right? So to me, in terms of what y'all, what you, what, what Biden really needs is to convene a panel of people who have actually been working around this, organizers on the ground who have pushed this conversation, like, oh, like throughout, not just this year, but the previous decades, like, we need less talking, <laughs> right? We need more in terms of people who have transformed our conversation and our language to be at the table and to hold and to be in positions of power. I think would be really actually interesting um, because it's, it's clear that he needs to address the criminal punishment system um, is if there was actually kind of an executive, in, an executive order and like a convening, convening a set of, or like a blue ribbon, blue ribbon panel with people who have who have uh, uh, left a period of incarceration, as well as those who work on these issues, to think about what are new proposals, right? That would reduce harm, um, that would shrink the system. But it's time in 2020. It's time we heard from a new set of voices. We don't need to hear from the same set of voices anymore, right? So yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, um, you talked a lot also in your presentation about 
money and where money comes from and how how it gets moved and decided where it goes. Um, uh, social work is often philanthropy funded and driven. Um, mm -hmm. And so you talked about the movement model for funding. So how has social work, do you think, been complicit in this de-radicalization? Um, what role might social workers play to support a movement model funding? And can we even trust philanthropy to fund a movement without it being usurped for white colonial interest? That is uh, so many good questions right now. Like my mind is like ding, 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 ding um, ab about the number of questions there. This is also, um, again, I know I stated this from the beginning of the talk, but such a pleasure to talk to, uh, to this group in part because I think a lot about philanthropy and a lot of the work that I do are, has been talking to philanthropists, right? Um, and, and, and it strikes me that it's that there, there's a, a lot of tension here, right, between social work and organizations, funders, and the larger movement here. I want to state very clearly that it's tough, that there's no, that it's not clear answers, um, that I am somebody who's extremely aware that so many social justice organizations um, are put in a really, in a, in a very difficult position that they do extraordinary work and they need to survive. And oftentimes the way that they survive is through um, funding from philanthropists. So like, I wanna state that like there is a power dynamics there, which is why, so some, one of the things that I'm just gonna say this and then I'm gonna get, get to address more of this question. Oftentimes um, funders, they say to me, hey, Megan, but like this organization, they didn't say that they didn't want to go and pursue this issue. And I, and which is, I think, something that is very common. It's like, right, like, let's say that you, I'm not sure, like, run an organization that is focused on education and that there is, let's say, um, CZI, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And they're like, you know what? We want to provide 100 computers or 100 laptops, right? And it's like, that's great, but that's probably not what you guys wanted to do. And that then takes away resources from your organization. And then they're like, so there's a big learning curve. But anyways, what I often say to funders, and I think it's important, not necessarily for like social workers, but for those especially who are perhaps are going to work like for foundations and or funders to understand that they need to hear differently. That because of the, because of the dynamics that are involved, because of power differentials between those that need money and that those that actually have money, that like disagreement is going to sound much different. And the responsibility, this is one of the things that I'm trying, like a lot of work with funders, but like, I'm not sure if that is possible, is that the, the work of organizations who are already doing important work is not to like figure out new ways to communicate their disagreement or to make funders better. That's not their work to do. They already got things to do, right? That like the work for foundations, the work for funders is actually to do that work to figure out like, how do they decolonize their mind? How do they do the important infrastructure work inside of their own foundation? So many foundations, especially in this moment right now, I also wanna say there has never been more money committed, at least committed, we know some of these found funders are a little sketchy. There has never been more money committed towards racial justice than in 2020. Foundations alone, $6 billion. Now, let's be clear, racial justice organizations always should have been funded at that level, but like this has provided, I think, a number of opportunities as well as challenges for so many funders. Funders always want to like, how can we do better? How can we do better? And like, and they, it's like all, all about, let me find a new organization. Let me find this new initiative. And oftentimes it's about that they actually need to shift their internal infrastructure, right? That like the infrastructure of the way that so many funding entities are actually like works and it's structured needs to shift itself. Now, in terms of um, kind of the work of, of, of social workers who are sometimes in these organizations, it's tough. Um, I have, and I'm sure there's many people on this call who have had these, right, these conversations with funders where there's a bit, bit of tension. And I, and I, like, I think that people have to be very careful oftentimes about the funding that they accept and the way that that funding is structured. I think it is also key for people who work in some of these organizations to be clear about like what their accountability mechanisms are and that they are accountable 
to their clients, to the communities that they actually serve. Um, and I think that that is, because sometimes I try to think about kind of what does an ecosystem of accountability actually look like for those of us who are in organizations and doing that work, as well as that receive money from funders, how do we make sure that mission creep doesn't happen? The gold standard, of course, is like multi-year funding that is unrestricted. Sure. But the reality is, is that many of us don't receive that type of funding. So what do we do when we receive one year funding and we need to receive a second year and it's restricted, right? And, and what grants should we just say no to? Because in what ways are we perhaps actually just doing the work, right, of capitalism? In what ways are we actually doing the work of undercutting movements? And I can't say from where I'm sitting, like, how and or what one should say no to. What I can say is that oftentimes the communities in which we actually work have no problem with saying, uh-uh, don't do that, right? And so one of the things that I think in this moment that is key for a lot of organizations who receive funding is to think much more about what are the accountability mechanisms to community. Um, so, so, Thank you. Accountability, what are accountability measures to community, right? That mm -hmm. is a great social worker question, considering how many asset maps and logic maps <laughs> and all of those things that I've paid to learn how to do here at the great school of social work. Not being condescending, y'all remember a little bit autistic, but like literally, I paid to like like that's what we that's what we learn. So lip implementing a lot of the things that we learn is one of the first things that social workers can do, because right, right, this is I'm I'm learning it right now. This is what they're teaching us. Mm -hmm. um, so one question that I would like to ask you uh, that changes gives a, a little, little, little bit is what has what has been slash is the role of unions and like the Communist Party in fighting for Black liberation against racist violence? Um, and thinking about like the Communist Party, just thinking about parties that are not just Democrats and Republicans. Like how mm -hmm. do we? Um, how have other political like facets helped black people? Yeah, no. So I think this is a great question. One that I'm probably not the best to answer if I'm perfectly honest. Um, but I do think in terms of, if we look at that, if we look at the long trajectory of black struggle in this country, it's been, it's been really important that one, the communist party has been very important to black people. Um, and so one of the issues is that I focus on early 20th century um, Black struggle and focus on the NAACP and their work around criminal procedure. But for those who are familiar with the Scottsboro incidents, there's two big cases that come out of that. Um, um, there's two big Supreme Court cases that are actually funded by the Communist Party. Um, and, like, and, 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 and this activism in terms of like wanting to, wanting to figure out what are different political frameworks, um, different ways of organizing uh, for Black people as they are trying to figure out how to make their lives matter or how to have the political system actually recognize and protect their lives throughout the 20th century is going to be key. Um, that I think that one of the things that I try to emphasize, especially in the earlier period, and that I think this touches on the, the Communist Party as well as like different in terms of political identities um, for Black people is that what to me is clear, especially in terms of the NAACP's work, is that they are never, they're trying to move. They're trying to, they are in terms of, they are rooted in a belief that Black people should be free from um, state violence and from white vigilante violence. They are rooted in a belief that something else is possible. And because nothing is possible, especially for Black Southerners at the time, then everything is possible. And so they are like trying to appeal at some, at some level to Woodrow Wilson, which is crazy, right? Because he how, how racist actually he was. They are trying to appeal to different politicians. They are trying to figure out what, what ways can they actually move politically. And so what is clear over the past 20, the, 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 the 20th century, um, is that African Americans are looking for um, different logics and different frameworks. And I think that is presented to them um, through the Communist Party, as well as through other radical Black organizations that emerge um, throughout the 20th century. And that has been really key um, in terms of these different kinds of praxis to Black organizing to get to where it's actually at today. 
Um, I think that we have time probably for one or two more questions. Um, I wanted to make sure um, that we got to this question um, that we had about social workers, because I think predominantly there's mostly social workers listening in the audience today. Um, and so how should social workers place themselves in the social movement without silencing the communities that the movement seeks to serve? Um, and is allyship beneficial to the black community? Yeah, so this, this is a good question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for social workers. I'm one, I like, I'm going to, I'm going to break from protocol. I'm going to say something. And then I actually want to hear from, can, is it possible if I can like actually bring to the fore for a minute, Nina and MJ, is that possible to address this question? Okay, cool. I'm going to do that as well. Um, I think that it's, it's tough in terms of depending on where you are. I, I mean, it, it is, even though social work is not in my main area, I am also aware that there's Kind of many different areas kind of where you guys are and where you're situated um in terms of kind of thinking about the role of social workers in the movement for black lives um i think it's i think some of the things that i said earlier are key one to be in conversation um and and also in terms of accountability right like to not take up space and or, or to speak over um uh, but to listen and learn um and the other thing that is key for me that I actually didn't talk a lot about in this talk today um, is the importance of imagination um, and imaginative spaces. Like that to me has been something that is really key in this in like this year um, and thinking in terms of the work that you do, especially in working with people and like being specialist at that. And I'm like, you know, as I was writing this talk and thinking about it, I'm like, oh, y'all are way better than me and, and people in terms of and in and, and my orbit of the people that I work with. But like as people who are specialists in working with people, like whether it's young children, whether it is adults, whether it's older people, like how do we cultivate an imagination, right? I sometimes think that young people are the best, right? There's like all these wonderful, sometimes I think about like where the wild things are and like as a kid and like that, that world of Max and the monsters was so real to me because I had this imagination. Now it's like, nah, like, I don't dream about that much because it's like, like life is just so difficult and there's so many pressing demands. Um, but I think that at least for me, thinking about the world that I want to live in, the world that I want my godchildren to live in, um, it means that I can't plan with what I see right now, right? In terms of what is available to me um, and that I, need to, that I actually need to root in something else. Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about kind of in terms of my role as a professor, how do I create imaginative spaces for my students? Um, how can I assign readings that might foster that? How can I create space even in, the, even in Zoom land online um, for that? Um, and that has been really important for me to think about. So yeah, Nina, MJ. <laughs> uh, I do have a... I think it's really important that, so one of our social work values is dignity, dignity and worth of a person, and then like, like the importance of human relationship. Um, mm -hmm. And being that people that get our work most of the times are marginalized people, um, and people that do the work are people that are in many ways less marginalized or white. So remember to center what your experience is, experience is and how to Literally, we get are taught to not center ourselves, but center the people that we're working with. As we work with people clinically, macroly, at every level, that's how we're taught to work with people. So how do you do the work? Center them, because if you're centering them, you won't then bring their ideas to the table because you know they're not yours, mm -hmm. right? Like, so I think I think that's a that's a one really important way that everybody could center the people that we're working with in whatever capacity. Um, yeah, I would really just echo, I think, what MJ and Megan have said already. Um, and also I work, my like day job is working with young people like teenagers. Um, and um, I'm like, they're like permanent adult guest on the youth advisory board and have helped co-create it with them. And I think the, I think your point of imagination is really valid. And I think also um, I've learned so much from, from working with them um, about asking people to show up in systems that don't work for them. Like the systems 
are not there designed to serve young people, um, whether it's attending a meeting or speaking to a board or whatever it may be, and really making sure that we are not only creating those relationships with young people where there's like that trust and we're centering their experiences, but also creating the systemic change with them um, so that they can show up in a way that makes sense and so show up in a way that like is beneficial for them. Um, and I think that applies obviously to any social work, um, but just directly speaking to my experience working with young people. I love this. I've like learned from both of y'all. Thank you. <laughs> well, I think that about wraps us up. MJ, did you have something else to say? Yeah, I just want to say there are some other great questions in the chat, but we want to get, we want to be sensitive to people's times. So we have three minutes left and we know that Dr. Shadow has a closing. Um, so I will pass the ball unless she says, go ahead and ask one last question. <laughs> oh, you're muted. You're muted. Right. I'm going to say that. All right, no, I go ahead and ask another question. I just wanted to say thank you and how like personally um, and professionally grateful I am. So let's use the time for another question. Our audience is here. Okay, so I think these two questions, um, for me, they exist kind of like, yeah, I won't, I won't get into how they exist, but we have a question about um, if it would be advantageous for black people to, uh, kind of center classism and uh, the way that oppression affects class and a growing and wealth in America. Um, would it be helpful for Black Lives Matter to center that? And I think that is a great combination of the question about W.E.B. -E du Bois, because I think people always forget that Black people be multiple classes. Like when Black people are talking, um, you're kind of, you're, you're not just talk like it is a class conversation because we exist in all of the classes. Um, another question here was Du Bois, uh, W. D. Du Bois said that um, you know the United States was never built for Black people. So mm -hmm. should we expect? Why should we expect reform? Mm -hmm. Should we slash? Why should we expect reform um, mm -hmm. from a country uh, mm -hmm. and that happened without violence? Okay. So this is a lot. This is, these are all really important questions though. And I love these questions and I love that you asked them. I thought I should say them out loud. <laughs> and I think it's so great that you asked them together in part because right, that like, especially in terms of this early 20th century, Du Bois is in terms of like seen as somebody as, like in terms of the talented 10th, right? And like, and thinking about how different ideas about what, what it means and how Black people, um, different strategies for Black people to be considered and treated as full citizens in this country. I do think in terms of, I, th I think we always need to talk about class. I think we always need to talk about capitalism. Um, I think that in terms of, uh, it, it strikes me that that is, at, at least in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement right now, something that it doesn't seem to be as present as, as it's been in different moments or different iterations of the Black Lives or the movement for Black Lives. Um, that there does seem to be, at least from different organizations that are connected with the movement, um, a very, I think, right on critique about racial capitalism, um, about capitalism in the black community, right? That capitalism can't save us, that, and that also kind of the ways that class operates in the black community. And this is something that has not yet received the attention that I think that it should. But I think it's crucial that we talk much more about that moving forwards, right? Seemingly one of the things right now I find so fascinating that people are always like, defund and abolition is like Black Lives Matter. I'm like, have you even Googled? There's a whole platform in terms of, it really is about like, in terms of like, how might we reimagine not just the criminal punishment system or the criminal legal system, right? But it's about all these different structures in our society, right? That limit, right, the fullness of, Black life, right? And the criminal punishment system as being just one of many different institutions. So yes, we can't get to where we need to get, go if we don't talk about class, if we don't talk about capitalism. Absolutely. In terms of why might we expect things, this society to operate in a different way, right? So like the country was not built. It wasn't. Absolutely not, right? Um, and, and, but what to me is striking is that there's these different moments um, for Black people themselves and for the United States government to be like these, basically these back to Africa movements, 
Um, and there was this moment, um, ah, I forget what president, ah, uh, uh, anyways, mind blank right now, um, in, in terms of trying to organize black people to go back to Africa. And they're like, nah, we staying here, we here right now. So to me, it's like, perhaps we shouldn't expect, we don't, we shouldn't expect American liberalism to save us. We shouldn't expect these institutions to save us, right? But we should, we should demand, and this, in, th these institutions can be transformed and changed, that we should be able to live full lives, right? That we should be able to live lives outside of cages, like where we can walk down a street with the hoodie on. These are, these are rights that we should all have. And so like, I think to me in terms of the expectations and or the kind of the far reach of like a racism in this country, nothing about that is surprising. Um, but yet still to me, what's exciting and like what gives me hope today, if I can even say hope today in this conversation and in this question um, is the organizing, is the dreaming, um, is this kind of new push, which seems to me um, at least in 2020, very different from the 60s um, in the sense of a lot of the 60s was focused on reform, like in terms of if we shifted, changed laws, changed political institutions, they could treat black people as full people. And then right now what we're seeing is that like, we need to transform actually how these institutions operate and not just transform, we need to get rid of some of these, right? That we need to center people of color, we need to center black people, we need to center indigenous people, we need to center Latinx, Asian, Amer Asian Pacific Americans, right? That like, we can, we can, like we can be the center and like think about new ways, new understandings of what justice and equality might actually look like. And so I think the potentiality has always what has fueled movements. Um, and that to me is what's been very exciting to me. It's also true that Du Bois was like, yo, like we can do this. I'm a right, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm gonna let you guys know through the crisis, I'm gonna write the truth and like just work until the end, right? Not here, didn't die here, right? You know, in terms of like that, that's a much, that's a whole nother lecture <laughs> around Du Bois, but like fighting until the end because that's what, that's what this country owes, you know? So that, that to me is, is, is crucial. So anyways, um, I'll, I'll end there. Um, I really, really appreciate the conversation as well as the many questions. Um, again, I am so grateful for the work that all of you do. Um, and I, it has just been a, a real treat to learn from you guys. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Really what? appreciate it. Thank you so, so, so much. Hey. Have a good night, everyone. All right, y'all, good night. Catch the, catch the video in your email. <laughs>